Today I want to share with you a, a sermon titled, A Good Fight. Actually, it's, uh, I shared a little, little bit of it during our uh, singles retreat uh, a, a while ago. And I thought about, actually, about this sermon for about two, three weeks. And I wanted to share this again. I felt this was very appropriate uh, for today and, uh, and, and, and the circumstance that we're in right now. Uh, let's read together 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. This is a letter that Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was like a son to him. Uh, some people say literally he might have even been an adopted son. I wouldn't go that far, but that was the type of relationship that Paul, the disciple of Christ, had with young Timothy. And this is, letter was written at an old age. In fact, you know, when Paul was nearing death, and he wrote this letter, he wrote this charge to Timothy. Let's read it together. Let's begin. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Altogether, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ear will want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his approaching. As I mentioned, this letter was written by Paul, and as he was nearing death, he decided to write a final letter to probably his favorite person, a person that he considered almost like his son. And he wanted to leave, not just leave a letter, but leave an encouraging charge to Timothy. Maybe you can say a final charge, final saying, final encouragement, final exhortation before he left to his precious child. There are several things that we need to make a note, several truths and facts that we need to glean from this passage. And one of that is that Paul clearly mentions and clearly reminds the young Timothy that we will, every one of us, one day will die and stand before God and be judged. You know, oftentimes when we're young, we don't think about death. We think that we're going to live forever. We think that judgment is far away, so we don't think about it. And Paul was probably thinking, that's probably what Timothy also, probably it has slipped his mind at times. Because when you're young, you don't think about death too often. But Paul here urges Timothy, you know, reminds Timothy, that day will come. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. Every one of us, one day, we are going to stand before God, and we will be judged. And the second thing that we can glean from this is Paul clearly reminds Timothy the things that we will be judged. Now, he doesn't say it directly, but from the, words, from, the, from the words in the letter, we can clearly see that Paul is telling Timothy that when we stand before God, we will be judged. And the things that we will be judged will not be based upon how much money we made or how big of a house we have or how much success we achieved on earth. But Paul clearly states that the the measure, the area in which we'll be judged is how well we did in sharing the word of God. Because Paul, you know, right after Paul tells Timothy that we will all be judged, he reminds Timothy, don't forget to preach the word of God because there's nothing more important. And I believe he said that because he knew, Paul knew, as well as Timothy, that when we stand before God, we're not going to be judged on how well we dress, how well we look, but how well we preach the word of God. 
And when Paul says preaching, he's not simply saying, you know, stand in front and in a, on a pulpit and preaching to the congregation. He simply means how well we did in sharing with others about the love of God. Because he reminds us, time will come when people will reject this wholesome truth, the word of God, where they will only want to hear from people what they want to hear. So Paul says it is all the more important for us to not to forget why God put us here. And that when we stand before God someday, that we will be judged on how well we preach the word of God to others. But also within this verse, within this passage contains, in my opinion, one of the most powerful charge that the Bible gives us in how we ought to live our lives. For me, you know, people always say, you know, what is your life verse? People oftentimes ask you, what is your favorite verse? What is the verse that you kind of repeat to yourself? What is the verse that you remind yourself of? And what is the verse that you try to live by? Well, I have one, you know, and this is not it. But this is probably ranks up there as my number two. Because to me, this is the most, one of the most powerful uh, charge that, the Bible gives us as far as how we are to live our lives on earth. And the charge starts in verse 7. Paul starts out this verse by saying the words, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. What does that mean? Was Paul a fighter? Was he a boxer? You know, maybe K-1, mixed martial arts? You know, he wasn't any of those things. But Paul wants to illustrate here, I have fought the good fight. Because he illustrates life as like a battle. You know, I've never been in a battle. I think most of you haven't either. In fact, probably none of you have been in a battle. But from what I've seen in television and from the movies, you know, it is not pretty as they glamorize it sometimes. But when you're in a battle, when you're always fighting, you never rest. Even when you're sleeping, people say you're always half awake. Because there's this constant threat, do you know, being aware that there's an enemy out there lurking around, waiting to just attack you. So you have to live your lives. You have to live throughout the day and and days and weeks and months. You have to be vigilant, constantly aware, fighting. But Paul says here, not only he said, you know, I have fought the fight, but Paul says, I have fought the good fight. That means Paul said, I have lived my life all of my days doing my best, being diligent and vigilant in preaching the word of God. But I didn't just do that, but I did it the best that I could. When Paul says, I have fought the good fight, it simply means that, you know, I have done the best that I possibly can. I have done the best that that God has enabled me to do. You know, I, I often, when I stand up here, I give illustration and stories of sports because I love sports. Uh, this past year, last year, was a very sad year for my team, Houston Rockets, because Houston Rockets has two superstars, Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming. And last year, just before they made it to the playoffs, both Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming got hurt. So that pretty much eliminated Houston's chance of, of uh, winning the championship. But somehow, they won the first round of playoffs by beating Portland. Amazing, a bunch of no-name players, and they beat Portland. But then on the second round, they had to meet uh, the team with the best record in the NBA, the, probably the best team in the NBA, Los Angeles Lakers, Kobe Bryant. And during, you know, before the game, I remember this interview they did with one of the players. His name was Luis Scola. And they interviewed him, and the, and the, uh, the, the interviewer asked Luis this question, knowing that, you know, Houston, you have no chance of winning. And Houston, you have a bunch of players who, are, who have you know, no-name players. That means they're not well-known. And yet they're facing like a team of all-stars. Los Angeles Lakers, a team with probably the greatest player on earth right now. So the reporter went to Luis thinking, you know, so how do you feel about you know, going into this, you know, to this game? You know, are you nervous? Are you scared? Are you intimidated? How are you dealing with this, knowing that, you know, you're, gonna, you're facing this foe that you cannot defeat? 
And I think the reporter went in asking that question, probably expecting an answer like, you know, uh, you know, we we'll, we have to, you know, do our best, and it's going to be hard, you know. We, you know, we come this far, you know, we lost our superstar, but you know, even if we lose, I'm sure, you know, we did okay. You know, typical answer like that, maybe in a very soft tone. But what was really amazing, you know, was that oh, the question that reporter asked was, "Are you scared? Are you scared going into this game?" And Luis replied. His response was. I'm not scared of anything or anyone. He says, you know, the only thing that I'm scared of is not doing my best and having regrets at the end of the game. You know, I wish I can say it like he did, but the way he said it was this. As a matter of fact, he says, you know, what's there to be scared about? There's nothing in this world that I'm scared of. There's, this is basketball, and I'm not scared of losing, and I'm not scared of any player. The only thing I'm scared of is knowing and looking at myself, knowing that, you know what, maybe I didn't do my best. He says, that's the only thing that I'm scared of, that during the match, that I didn't do my best. Paul says that I have fought the good fight. And that's exactly the words, the feeling that Paul is trying to convey. That when we stand before God, can we stand before God and say, God, I did my best. I did everything that I possibly could. You know, I don't say this to boast, but if I had one fear, I would have to say it is that. And that is that I don't want to look, you know, stand before God and look back at my life and have regrets and say, you know, you know, I wish I could have done this. I wish I could have done that. And my greatest fear is to know that, that I would not stand before God and, and look at my life and say, I wasted my life. Honestly, I want to stand before God and be able to say, I have fought the good fight. I have preached the word the best that I could. And I have, I have helped others to grow to have, and to have better relationship with God. Can I stand before God and truly tell him that I did my best? Can we truly say that? Right now, my answer would be no. And that, to me, is the greatest fear that I have. And my goal in life is to make sure that, that I live the rest of my life so that when I do stand before God, that I can, with somewhat of with assurance, that I did do my best in sharing the Word of God and helping others grow. I have fought the good fight. And, but, and then Paul states in the same sentence, I have fought the good fight. And then he goes on to say, I have finished the race. It is very odd. First half of the verse, he uses illustration of a, you know, fighting a boxer, perhaps. And then later on, he uses illustration of a race, a marathon. He says, I have finished the race. The phrase finished, I have finished the race, when you look at it, it really has two meanings. One is to never give up. And two, it means not to miss out on opportunity. You know, we often think that race is something that every one of us are in. It's just not true. You can only be in a race when you consciously choose to be in the race. You're not just in the race by living. If you're not consciously telling yourself, I am part of this race, I am in this competition, then we are just simply spectators. So the thing that we can glean from this is that, you know what? In life, it's an opportunity to serve God, to share the word of God. It is an opportunity and we should not miss out. And the second thing is, I have finished the race. Finished, it means that we are to never give up. You know, as you all know, I, besides sports, I also love to watch television. And, and I say, you know, you know Pastor Kim and, and uh, uh, Sandy, some of them, I, you're lucky because um, Korean TV programs are so much better than American TV programs. It's cleaner, more entertaining. And one of the shows, my number one favorite show used to be One Night and... I, come on, one night, two days. And, 
And then the second favorite show is Three Wheels. Sebaki. <laughs> and then uh, now it's not the third, but another show that I really like is called, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, A Measure of a Man, Qualifications of a Man. Namjae uh, Jagyok, was it? You know? it's, about, it's, a, it's a show about six men, and they challenge themselves with different difficult tasks each and every week, saying, you know, we're men. As men, we need to test ourselves. And they challenge themselves to different things. And I remember, I think this past week, they told themselves they're going to fly a fighter jet. And in order to fly a fighter jet, they have to go through this training, gravity, and, and they, were, they got sick and everything. But the show that really caught my eyes was about three, four weeks ago when they decided we're going to run half a marathon. Well, not a full marathon. Full marathon is 24 miles. They decided to run 12 miles, I think, which turns out to be about 21 kilometers, 22 kilometers. So they decided, you know what, we're going to try 22 kilometers. Let me just tell you this. I, I don't jog now and I don't look like it, but I used to jog. And, and running 22 kilometers is not easy. I, I, I could run, I ran 10 kilometers and it's okay. But you have to train oh, quite a while before you can run 10 kilometers, let alone 20 kilometers. And these six men decided they're going to train for about three weeks and do it. But what made this, uh, one of the characters in this uh, TV show, it was very compelling was, I forgot his name. He's a really tall and skinny man. What's his name? Yusok? Yunsok. He's, he's about six feet tall and weighs about maybe 40 kilograms. He's very, very skinny. But not only is he skinny, there's, there's two types of skinny. Strong skinny and weak skinny. He was a weak skinny man. And, and I'm not saying that to make fun of him or anything like that. But really growing up, he was skinny. And even during some of the shows... They would have physical competitions. He could barely do like two or three push-ups. You know, that's how weak he was. And I think that's one of the reasons why they chose him, because you know, everyone's really kind of curious how he will do on this particular task. And I remember, you know, they all decided, this six decided to run, and, and they all, you know, first finished, second, third, fourth, they finished within two, two and a half hours, three hours. And this older gentleman in his 50s, he finished it, you know, maybe within five hours. And the last person was this tall, skinny man. And uh, halfway through, I mean, he was running and, you know, maybe about, you know, 10 kilometers in, he, you know, of course, he, he, was, he stopped jogging because he was on and off, on and off because he was having difficulty breathing. And then about, the, you know, a little after that, 12, he, you know, his, his legs started aching and, and again, you know, I've, I've ran, I've jogged a little, you know, and so I understand that, you know, if you're not used to it, if you start jogging, your muscle, your joints all of a sudden ache, and, uh, you, you know, it's hard for you to walk. And he was going through that where he was getting cramps, he had to st stop, he was raining, and he had to lie down in the middle of the road, and they had to stretch him, and, and then he would try to jog again, but he couldn't, and he almost threw up several times, he, he, you know, he bent over on the side of the road because he was feeling nausea, and and so forth, so he was getting sick. And, and by the time he reached 15 kilometer, all the other staff, now this was no longer a TV program. This, w this was no longer about entertainment. Now all the directors and producers and all the other um, people in, in the TV show that were, who were taping him, every one of them were saying, oh, okay, this is enough. It's not, it's not even funny anymore. This is not about TV anymore. He says, you have to stop. This is about your health. And they were trying to encourage him to stop and stop and I mean, even to the point when he got to the 15-kilometer mark, he could not even walk by himself. Where he had to, he grabbed her like a wooden ply, you know, plywood from the side of the road, and he was using that to walk. And people were saying, why are you doing this? Just stop, you know? You've done your best. You've done more than what anyone else thought you could do. And his, his answer was really was very, very touching. And it kind of brought tears to my eye. He said, he said, you know, all my life, he said, I have never, ever finished a race like this. He says, all my life, I've never completed a physical competition in my life. He says, he's never done that. And growing up, he says, his mother kind of, you know, kind of ridiculed him and rebuked him for not doing that well. And, and he said, you know, before the race, he said he made, a he made a commitment. And he was determined that no matter what, he was going to finish the race. And he said he was not going to give up. And at the five hour and 30 minute mark, finally, with crutches, 
Actually, by then, because it was the finish line, he put the crutch away, I, I think, and he finished the race. And oh, there was not a dry eye uh, around when he finished the race. You know, so many times we miss out on the precious opportunity to serve God. You see, the ministry that we're doing here at Angf, this is not a life that we're living in. It is a fight, it is a battle, it is a war, it is a competition, it is a race. And we have chosen, we have made a decision to be in this race. We're not spectators. And so often in life, we're tempted, we have urges in life to simply give up. Because why? It's too hard. It's just too hard to go on. And we're faced with this great temptation at times to simply give up. But I want you to know that the race that we're running here with All Nations Community Fellowship, to spread the word of God, to share the love of God, it is a wonderful race. It is an important race. It is a race that it is a privilege for us to be part of. It is, a, it is an opportunity that God's given to all of us. And we should not give up. And we should know that this is a wonderful opportunity. And we should not give up. And so often in life, we give up on so many things. We give up on our family. We give up on our, lot, on our spouses, our wives, our husbands, our children, our ministry. We say things we say things like, you know, it's hopeless, and we give up. You know, just so you know, in America, do you know that they, they did a survey and they interviewed people who divorced? For many reasons, they got divorced for many reasons, but they would interview them, and they would ask this question, you know, what is one regret that you have in your life? And it's amazing, vast majority, and I was very surprised to hear this. He says, vast majority of the people that got divorced, he's they say their biggest regret was the fact that they didn't try harder and they gave up in their marriage. That they should not have given up so easily. But too often we give up on people because they don't respond to us like we want them to. They're not as our type of people. Maybe we don't get along as well. Maybe, we're not, maybe we don't look alike. Maybe we don't have the similar personality. But sometimes we give up. But I want you to remind yourself that we are all here because people, because we're not really, we're not here because we're so likable. We're not. Because there's very few people in this world that are really, truly likable. Many of us, we have temper. Many of us, we're, you know, we're lazy. Many of us, we have so many faults. But you know what? We are here because despite our weaknesses, despite our faults, and despite our failures, there was somebody out there, or maybe perhaps they're in here, they did not give up on us. Paul says, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. And what that means, Paul said, in the ministry and the people that God's given me, Paul says, no matter how difficult it was, I did my best. And no matter how difficult it was, I did not give up. We should not give up on people and we should not give up, more importantly, on church. Too often I see people leave church because church has problems. And you know, I, I've been a pastor, even though I'm still young, I've been a pastor for a long time. In fact, I've been a pastor of probably including my seminary days, working part-time. I've worked maybe under six different churches. And let me tell you, I have never found a perfect church. I have never found a church without problems. Even the church that I served in Houston, it was one of the most well-known church with great leader. That church has so many problems too. But church, according to the Bible, tells us that it's our family. And I mentioned to you earlier how, you know, I say that all the time, Ang family, you know, our family group. And I mentioned about Friday, Christmas Eve, what a wonderful time we had. Why? Because it was family. We were not church members. We were not co-workers. We were not acquaintances. We came together as a family, and we shared like a family, and we encouraged each other as a family. And Bible tells us church is a family. Church is a bride of Christ, the most, most important relationship in a family. We do not give up on a family because there's a problem. We do not give up on family because there are issues. You know, I remember a long time ago, one of the church members came to me, and he said, you know, 
Pastor Paul, I want to leave my church. And I said, why do you want to leave the church? Because, you know, I don't like the pastor. There are some problems, you know. And I told this church member that, you know, I don't know exactly what the problem is. And in the end, you have to make the decision. But I said, you know, but my advice to you is this. As a Christian and as a family, as, as a someone, as a member of that church, when somebody comes and poops in our backyard, we don't, we don't move because somebody comes and make, makes a mess of our backyard when, when it's smelly and dirty. When somebody does that, we do our best to, to clean it up, to make it present, presentable and make it as beautiful as it once was. And same thing with family. When there are problems, when there are issues at church, we don't say, oh, it smells, I don't like it, and we leave. We say to ourselves, this is family, this is my house, and we do our best to clean it up the best that we can. And so often we give up on church as well. There's one last thing that Paul said that was truly encouraging, and, that, and he said it after. He said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. And here's the thing that really, you know, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. It kind of raises the tension. But then the following verse, it brings us peace and comfort. Because Paul goes on to say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. You know, not every battle on earth we're going to win, and not every race is going to turn out the way we want it to turn out. But I want you to know, and what Paul says is this, no matter how hard the difficult and the difficult the race is, and some of us, we might end the race earlier than other people. Some of us will run whose goal is to run 24 miles, while others is maybe 12. Everyone has a different point of ending. But in the end, what God tells us is this. When we do our best, and when we don't give up, and on that day when we stand before God, will await us a great prize. And God will be pleased. You know when God said, when the verse says, you know, there waits for us a great prize, I'm not thinking that God's going to give me a, a trophy or a gift certificate. But for me, it's simple words from my God, my Father, my Creator, saying, well done, my good and faithful servant, and that He will be pleased with me. There's nothing on earth I desire more than to live my life pleasing to God. You know, earlier today, I kind of, said to Brother Ilbin, you know, I confess to you, you're a better singer than me. You know, you all know that, you know, I joke around about my looks and so forth. And, but to be honest with you, we all know, we all have weaknesses, we all have faults. I have my weaknesses, I have my faults. When I look at my life, I know who I am. I know my heart. I know that I can be very lazy. I know that I'm quick to anger, especially to my wife. I know that my personality is I'm very impatient and there's nothing to boast about. I can be very selfish and the list can go on and on and on. I have so many faults and I have so many weaknesses. But there's one thing that I fear more than anything else on earth. You know, I have weaknesses, I have faults and I have problems, but those things, you know, they worry me. But nothing worries me more than to stand before God and look back at my life and see that I have wasted the opportunities that God's given me. And I look at my life and I look at everything I have as an opportunity. Despite all of my weakness, sometimes I can't believe I stand here every Sunday and preach to you. Despite all of my weaknesses and despite all of my faults, I can't believe you would actually hear my words. So I know what a precious opportunity this is. And I know what an amazing race I've been part of. And I hope that all of you guys understand that too. Despite all of our faults, God has given us this precious opportunity to serve in this race through all nations, community fellowship. Almost every day when I pray, and I mean that, I tell God in my heart that I have no greater desire than to stand before you someday and be able to say, 
I have fought the good fight, Lord. I have finished the race. And God, I have remained faithful. It is my prayer, it is my hope, that all of us here, members of All Nations Community Fellowship, that we can and we will all say, in the end, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. I pray that we will all stand before God one day together and be able to say these words. Let us pray.